गुड आफ्टरनून भारत रत्न प्रोफेसर सी एन आर राव फैकल्टी मेंबर्स ऑफ द सेंटर स्टूडेंट्स एंड स्टाफ इट्स माई प्लेजर टू वेलकम यू ऑल टू प्रोफेसर वी रामलिंग स्वामी मेमोरियल लेक्चर इंस्टीट्यूटेड एट द सेंटर अवर सेंटर जे एन सी एस आर इन द ईयर नाइनटीन नाइनटी नाइन सपोर्टेड बाई द डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ बायोटेक्नोलॉजी गवर्नमेंट ऑफ इंडिया most of us are familiar with the life and contributions of uh, late professor ramalinga swami he richly contributed to human nutrition disorders his works on liver disorder and cardiovascular diseases are well known and well recognized he was one of the outstanding biomedical scientists of our country and he held important positions in the country including being the director general of the Indian Council of Medical Research Over the years many eminent biologists have delivered this lecture to name a few Dr Shekhar C Mande Dr Soumya Swaminathan Professor S Mayer Dr M K Ban Dr K Srinath Reddy Dr G B Nair Dr G Padmanabhan Dr M S Valiathan and so on Today's lecture is being delivered by Professor Gagandeep Kang. I would like to thank you, Professor Kang, for accepting our invitation. Despite I know how busy you are at Velour, due to the ongoing pandemic, we opted to have the lecture online. So Kang is a well-known figure among the research communities worldwide. She is a professor at Wellcome Trust Research Laboratory. and the division of gastrointestinal sciences at the christian medical college cmc velour so kang conducts interdisciplinary research on enteric infections and child health her team has evaluated vaccines in preclinical and clinical phase studies for rotavirus and cholera professor kang is a highly accomplished medical scientist she has published over 375 papers in reputed international journals and authored a few books she is also advising who in many capacities in committees related to epidemic preparedness innovations and immunization programs and i have had the pleasure of serving on a committee briefly that's the national super model in respect of covid-19 in which professor kang was an expert member she is the first woman working in india to be elected as a fellow of the royal society she is also the first indian woman to be elected to the fellowship of the american academy of microbiology and the only physician scientist to receive the infosys award in life sciences she is also a fellow of the indian national science academy and indian academy of sciences the list goes on i now invite uh, professor kang to deliver this memorial lecture on the topic virus vaccines and variants mr mm -hmm. kang please thank you very much for the introduction and for the invitation i'm going to be talking to you today about the virus and about where we are in terms of treatments and about the vaccines that have been developed so far and variants i think there is just so much news so much hype that is in every part of the world now it becomes sometimes very difficult to make sense from all the noise so i think we have the wrong set of slides sorry can you see my slides now yes madam okay so 
So we're going to talk about the virus, the vaccines, and the variants. And we've lived through a really remarkable year. It was remarkable in many ways. It was the year where we had the most fires. It was the year where the ice caps melted like never before. It was the year when coral bleaching was at an all time high. It was one of the hottest years on in record. It was also the year of SARS coronavirus 2, even though it was originally labeled as 2019. This was not unexpected. This was something that we had been predicting for a while. If we look at outbreaks, the number and the diversity of outbreaks has increased over the past 30 years. And if we look at infectious diseases that have emerged over this time from AIDS to Zika, there is nothing that we do not know. Why are we seeing all these infections? A lot of them are zoonotic. They are also spreading in humans because of our behaviors and in the ways that we are changing the world whether that is trade or travel or cutting down forests or migrations, everything that we do is leading to more and more infectious diseases emerging and spreading around the world. Now, if we look at coronaviruses themselves, we had the first coronavirus that came into humans and actually killed people. It was the fifth coronavirus that is in humans. And this was the severe acute respiratory syndrome virus. It was first reported in 2003. It infected about 8,000 people. It killed about 10% of the people that it infected. And because this was a virus that spread from person to person only when people were symptomatic, it was a relatively easy virus to control because it was possible to isolate people who had been infected with this virus. So really good infection control solved the problem of transmission. And since 2004, there have been no cases of SARS reported anywhere in the world. Then we had another virus, and this one is still with us. This is the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome virus. It was first identified in humans in 2012. It has spread to many countries around the world. So far, it has infected about 2,500 people. It has a much higher case fatality rate. It kills about one third of the people that it infects. So in fact, we have been quite lucky with SARS coronavirus too, if we can say that. It's a hugely more transmissible virus than the ones we have seen before, behaving more like the common cold coronaviruses that we know reasonably well, but also having a very low case fatality rate compared to either SARS or MERS. Now, when we look at viruses that are public health problems, it's very important for us to be able to measure how much of a problem this virus is. So what are the sources of data that really matter? How many people are infected? This we can get from zero surveys and we can get it from confirmed cases. How many people get very sick? that we get from hospitalizations and from COVID-19 deaths. How much of a problem is this that we get from excess deaths that happened during the pandemic? Some of these indicators are lagging indicators, which means that the indicator comes after the infection has already happened. So death, for example, is a lagging indicator that comes after confirmed cases and hospitalizations. 
For each of these sources of data, we need five criteria for assessment of their reliability and their validity. Are they representative? Are they subject to bias? Is there uncertainty? Could there be measurement and sampling errors? When were these results obtained and where were these results obtained? In India, we have multiple sources of data, but what are the usable sets of data that we have? For me, I think it is the number of confirmed cases, which I don't follow as an absolute number, but more in terms of trajectories. And the only things that we really know is the number of tests done and the numbers that test positive. Frequently, we don't even know which test was being used. The number of deaths matters, but we know that that is an undercount. And then we have zero surveys where there is huge discrepancy between the surveys that have been reported so far. So it becomes a little difficult for us to be able to understand what the state of the pandemic in our country really is. And if there is one lesson we learn from this, I hope that it will be that for public health, we need to measure reliably what matters and we are not doing that at this time. These are graphs and maps for the situation in India. And you can see from the daily confirmed number of cases that we have a slight uptick that has started in the last 10 days. Is this the start of a second wave? It's certainly possible, but we will need to wait and see. If we look at what's happening in terms of biweekly confirmed cases, yellow is the lowest number of cases and the dark blue is the darkest. And in India, we are in the 100 to 1000 category. So still towards the low end of confirmed cases per million people in our country. If we look at the share of COVID-19 tests that are positive, WHO recommends that we should be testing enough that we stay below 3% positives. And you can see that in India, we are at about 2% positive. So our testing is adequate for the number of cases that we are detecting. A strange feature of the pandemic in India is the low number of deaths. And this is true not only of India, but of South Asia. And for much of Sub-Saharan Africa, with the exception of South Africa. Why is this? It's still unexplained, though there are many hypotheses. Now, coming to what the virus does to people, I think it's important to understand what the kinetics of disease are. The incubation period is about five days. And after incubation, if you're going to develop symptoms, they start with fever, cough, fatigue, loss of taste, loss of smell, all the things that we know. It takes about a week for people to develop somewhat severe disease, about 10 days for it to become a critical illness. So I think it's very important that people understand what the timelines are, because if you need to manage illness or treat illness, you need to know where and when you will identify these patients. Will you get them in the beginning of disease? Will you get them after they develop severe disease and what kinds of treatments can you use then? This virus is a virus that infects not only the cells in the system that it attacks, which is the respiratory system, but it also does a huge amount of endothelial damage. It results in activation of complement. And very peculiarly, this causes both micro and microvascular thrombosis that results in the ability of the virus to produce disease that affects multiple organs. 
As we study this virus more and more, we find that the pathophysiological processes that we see are really quite varied. There is direct virus mediated injury, there's endothelial activation and damage. There is both micro and macrovascular thrombosis, complement activation, neutrophil netosis, a strong inflammatory response, and we are now seeing a fair amount of autoimmunity as well. So the clinical manifestations can be very, very varied, but it's clear that we don't know what the sequelae are of mild, moderate, or severe disease. We've only begun to understand or begun to look at long COVID syndrome. Within the disease itself, there are multiple endophenotypes and any treatments that we develop need for us to understand the pathways to severe disease. So this is why the timing of therapeutic approaches matters. If you give remdesivir to somebody who has been in a hospital for 10 days, are you doing that drug, which is an antiviral, justice? Or should you be looking at giving dexamethasone early in illness? Wherever you want to treat mild infections, we should be going for an antiviral treatment. And when treat when illness becomes severe, we really need to look at anti-inflammatories and at anticoagulants. Where host immunity matters for prevention, pathogenesis, or treatment, then both vaccines and therapies need to be evaluated in appropriate populations. So where have we gotten to so far? We are not doing particularly well with treatments, finding treatments that work. I think all of you will remember the great controversies about hydro hydroxychloroquine, where it should be used, in whom it should be used for prophylaxis, for treatment. The proposal that we could try antiretrovirals, lopinavir, ritonavir. And ultimately, we found that all of these drugs really failed. HCQ, lopinavir, ritonavir, interferon, even remdesivir in the solidarity trial did not validate the results of the National Institutes of Health. So where are we? We had the results from the large recovery study in the UK, which showed that dexamethasone worked. This was confirmed in the solidarity trial, so really in thousands of patients who were given this. And then yesterday we had this publication in the New England Journal of Medicine for data that had been presented a couple of weeks before, showing that tocizumab and sarilumab work in critically ill patients. There are also data that have been generated in the US that indicate that monoclonal cocktails for care home residents prevent infection. So we have some treatments for severe disease and we have some prevention strategies for people who are at high risk. The problems of course with monoclonals is that the virus can evolve away from them as it seems to have already done. So treatments that work and treatments that don't work require rigorous evaluation. Now, when we started out, we started with repurposing and it makes sense because that's the fastest way to get a drug, but it's essentially a directed fishing expedition. We know more now about making antivirals than we ever did before, but it's still a hard task. And both repurposing and new drug development have received much less attention and funding than vaccines, despite the fact that we have the Therapeutics Accelerator, which is a collaboration between multiple agencies to test new drugs. If we look back at where China was in February, they had in February 2020, 120 clinical trials that were registered. 
Very few of them completed recruitment. None of them resulted in any treatments that were useful. In India, we have over 100 registered clinical trials for all kinds of drugs, from therapies that derive from traditional medicine to antivirals and antibodies. None of them plans to recruit more than 1,000 patients. Most of them recruit under 200 patients. When we want results that are robust, we will only get them from large multi-center studies. And so far, we have not really done much of that except for engaging in solidarity. Moving now from the virus and disease to vaccines, we have a number of platforms that are available. And I think it is a testament to how much vaccinology has advanced in the last 20 years that we have been able to move from traditional vaccines, which consisted of giving either the whole virus live attenuated or inactivated, or parts of the virus, to being able to deliver the message for how to make viral proteins. And those classes of vaccines are vectored vaccines, DNA and RNA vaccines. Why were we able to move so fast? Last year, at this time, people asked me how long it would take to make a vaccine. And I said 12 to 15 months, and I thought I was being hugely optimistic, but building on what I knew. We've moved a lot faster than that. And why were we able to move so fast? I think it's two major reasons. One of them is the vaccinology advances in the past 20 years. So shown here is work that came out of the Vaccine Research Center at the National Institutes of Health. When studying respiratory syncytial virus, a virus for which vaccines were developed in the late 1950s, which resulted in activated vaccines, which resulted in enhancement of respiratory disease when vaccinated children got infected. There were studies that were done at the VRC that demonstrated that when you have a natural RSV infection, you make three kinds of antibodies. Antibodies that are potent neutralizers, and these antibodies are made in very small amounts, but also moderately neutralizing antibodies and weakly neutralizing antibodies that are made in much larger amounts. Now, the weakly neutralizing antibodies, when you give a vaccine, these are induced quite well but they are antibodies that decline with time. The most potent neutralizing antibodies are really to a confirmation of the spike protein of RSV that is the pre-fusion confirmation before it adheres to the host cell and gets in. Once it was found that the most potent neutralization was to the prefusion structure of the glycoprotein, it was possible for scientists at the VRC to then design the immunogen so that it induced a really robust immune response. And these vaccines, based on this rational design approach, are now in development. Much of what was learned with RSV was applied to SARS coronavirus. And a lot of what we have been able to do with SARS-CoV-2 was because of this. The second was really organizational preparedness following Ebola. Ebola was really quite a disaster because for Ebola, we had had a vaccine that had sat in a freezer which had been developed by the Public Health Agency of Canada and this vaccine was taken up by a company in the US that did not develop the vaccine further. So when Ebola hit West Africa in 2014, 
it took almost 10 months for WHO, for public health agencies around the world to work with the affected countries to think about how to evaluate these vaccines and to get vaccine trials going. It turned out that the vaccine was really good, but by that time, about 60% of the people who had been infected had died. So a lot of people came together then to say that we didn't want to see this kind of situation again. And the WHO decided that it would present every year what was called the global R&D blueprint. What are the top 10 threats to the world and can we be better prepared for them? In addition to the work that the WHO was doing, a number of players, including the Wellcome Trust, the Department of Biotechnology, the Government of Norway, came together to establish the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations. And the idea was to be able to make vaccines before infectious disease outbreaks occurred, and then to be able to give these vaccines to people in affected countries without need for them needing to worry about the price of these vaccines. So when CEPI was established, CEPI decided that it would identify from the WHO R&D blueprint what the top threats were for which vaccines were feasible. And among the top three candidates were Lhasa, MERS coronavirus, and Nipah. Subsequent to that, Rift Valley fever and chikungunya were added. And then in 2018, CEPI started a new program for Disease X or platform technologies, where the idea was, if we have a sequence of a virus, can we make a vaccine that can get into the clinic in a period of three months? Everybody thought at the time that this was quite an ask, but at least we would be making a start to have platform technologies that would enable rapid response. So last year when the sequence for SARS-CoV-2 was announced on the 11th of January, Within two weeks, CEPI had funded the first three programs, and what they did was essentially take all of their MERS coronavirus programs and tell them to work on SARS-CoV-2. So AstraZeneca, the vaccine that is now being produced, was through a program that was with CEPI for MERS coronavirus. CEPI ultimately wound up funding 12 candidates and is now leading what is called the vaccine pillar of the access to COVID-19 tools accelerator. So what lessons had we learned from other coronaviruses, from the MERS program that allowed us to think about vaccines, from the SARS program to understand what we needed to focus on? From the work that had been done on both SARS and MERS, it was very evident that the neutralizing antibodies that are made to the coronavirus are directed mainly at the spike protein and in the spike protein, mainly at the receptor binding domain that allows for the virus to bind to its receptor, which is the ACE2 protein. And if you see here at figures A and B, you can see that the overlap between the SARS-CoV and SARS-CoV-2 is near complete. And this is why it was possible for us to begin to move really quickly with designing vaccines and then getting them into production very quickly. The Moderna vaccine, which was the first to enter human trials, did it in less than six weeks from design of the vaccine to actually going into humans. 
So where are we today? We have 200 vaccines that are not yet in human trials, 40 that are being evaluated for safety, 27 that are being evaluated for immunogenicity, 20 that are in clinical efficacy trials, eight that are in limited use, and four that have a full licensure. There are also four vaccines that entered into clinical testing and have been abandoned post phase one for a variety of reasons. Where are we today? We know that vaccines work. When we started out, I was part of the committee with WHO that developed the target product profile where we said, what are the minimum acceptable criteria for licensing a vaccine? And we said it should be a vaccine that should have at least 50% efficacy, not require more than two doses, be something that is use, usable in adults and provides protection for at least six months. And we also had what are called preferred product characteristics where we hoped that any vaccine would have greater than 70% efficacy. Now, why were we not ambitious? I think we were building on the fact that this was a mucosal infection and for mucosal infections, vaccines usually don't work very well. In this case now with SARS-CoV-2, we have multiple vaccines with efficacy data. These include vaccines that have been made on the mRNA platform Vaccines that have, are made with adenovirus vectors, vaccines that are inactivated, and subunit vaccines. So four platforms have already shown us that they have clinical efficacy data. And vaccines have begun to be rolled out across the world. If we look at how vaccines are being rolled out, this is the share of the population that has received at least one dose of a COVID-19 vaccine. And for comparison, I'm just showing three countries here, the UK, the US, and India, just to deliver the message that there is a lot that we need to do in our country. Now, if we look at the data that are emerging from different parts of the world, Israel has vaccinated 88% of its population, and that's why it has been possible to obtain these data. This is data published yesterday in the New England Journal of Medicine, showing the effect of the Pfizer vaccine on SARS-CoV-2 infection symptomatic infection, hospitalization, and severe COVID-19. As you can see, these are data for vaccines that have been given as a single dose, as well as the second dose. And the numbers that I've got here are for seven days after the second dose of the vaccine. 92% protection against infection, 94% against symptomatic COVID-19, 87% against hospitalizations, 92% against severe disease. You can see that from the figures that we had put down for WHO, these vaccines are completely outperforming our expectations. But there are threats to these vaccines, and these threats are coming from the virus changing itself. This awareness of what was happening with cases going up and the potential for vaccines to not be able to address the virus came really from the UK in December where we started to see a new isolate with several changes that began to increase very, very rapidly, shown here in the bright red color. 
that has been followed by other variants of concern. These are called 501YV1, which is the variant that was found, identified first in the UK as a, a matter of public health importance. And 501V2 shown here in orange is the variant that was identified in South Africa. And we have most recently uh, variants that have been emerging also in other parts of the world. So why do these variants matter? Why do mutations in a virus matter? From a public health perspective, there are five reasons why we need to consider these mutations. Can the mutation change our ability to detect the virus? We saw this with the UK variant where there was a deletion that resulted in one set of PCR primers not being, uh, not picking up the S gene target. Can the mutations help the virus to cause more severe disease? There is some data towards this. Can the mutations help the virus to spread faster? Again, transmission it has been measured and seems to be increasing. Can the mutations negate drug or monoclonal antibody therapies? We don't know about drugs yet, but it certainly seems to be the case for monoclonal antibodies. Can the mutation help the virus escape vaccine-induced immunity resulting in reinfection and disease? And data have just begun to emerge for this. So if we look at the variant of concern, the first one that we saw, 501YV1, also known as B117, this is a variant that has now spread globally. We have over 180 detected cases in India. And if we look at the key mutations in the B11 spike, this is looking down at the spike trimer. N501Y is a mutation that is uh, that allows the virus to bind better to the ACE2 receptor, hence potentially increasing its ability to be transmitted. It also results in an increase in replication so that an infected person sheds more virus than someone with an ancestral SARS-CoV-2 lineage. If we look at whether there is neutralization by immune sera, you do see neutralization, but the amount of neutralization decreases. This is an evaluation of the ancestral virus and the B117 virus with immune sera derived from people who had received the Pfizer vaccine. Nonetheless, the Pfizer vaccine still works very well in people who are infected with B117. And there were data that came out earlier this week from Scotland that demonstrated that the Pfizer vaccine was preventing severe disease and death. The next variant that came to our attention was 501YV2. This one has an additional mutation that is of great concern, which is the E484K mutation. And this was identified first in South Africa, but is now a virus that has been reported from multiple countries, including several cases from India. In order to evaluate whether this virus would be able to be protected from by vaccines, the, an experiment was designed taking sera from people who were infected during the first wave and people who were infected in South Africa in November of 2020 when this strain had begun to emerge. And essentially, what it showed was that in people who were infected during the first wave, their sera were not able to neutralize this virus particularly well. 
So there was immune escape of the 501Y V2. This has been validated in clinical efficacy studies. This, these are data from the Novavax trial, where the, against the original strain, the vaccine gave 96% protection. Against the UK variant, it was 86%. And against the South African variant, it was 60% protection. We now have another variant, which is called P1, which emerged in Brazil and has also begun to spread to many countries around the world. India just reported its first case of this strain. And while fewer studies have been done on this strain, it is a matter of concern because the number of cases in places that had very high seroprevalence rates, very high rates of infection in October of 2020 have now begun to see a rapid increase in cases. So is this a virus that escapes immunity, it does seem that this is likely. So these viruses are not only transmissible, they are also able to replicate in people who have been previously vaccinated. In the last couple of weeks, we've also had variants being documented in the US, the variant from California is an interesting variant because it's showing for the first time that recombination may happen, not just variation. You may be able to get a hybrid virus if people are infected with viruses from two different lineages. It does seem to be a more contagious virus, but it's not spreading as much as others. And most recently, we have had a new variant, B1526, that has been identified in New York, which has a mutation S477N, which will be investigated further. So for all these variants, as we identify them, we need to understand how much of a threat they are. So what does all of this mean? It means the data that we have so far tells us that SARS-CoV-2 is an unusual virus in that it causes disease by a very wide range of pathogenetic mechanisms. The risk factors are broadly very well described, diabetes, hypertension, cardiovascular disease, age. But there is huge heterogeneity in severe disease in individuals and in populations. So it's impossible to predict which young person might develop severe disease. And with populations, as I pointed out, in India, why don't we have more severe disease? Why have we not had more deaths, given the number of infections we have had, according to our seroprevalence surveys? Vaccines work surprisingly well for a mucosal infection. As somebody who's worked on vaccines for mucosal infections for the past 20 years, I have to say that I was not expecting vaccines to work this well. And to me, that seems to indicate that though we have worried very much about whether antibodies matter, how much cell-mediated immunity will matter, should we be engineering vaccines so that they have a TH1 skew. I think what we will see is that antibodies are going to be the key determinants of protection. And this is very important because there are many vaccines in the pipeline and it is not going to be possible for us to do many phase three trials. So we will have to think about alternative strategies for evaluating vaccines. And if we can get a correlate of protection, an immune readout that tells us that people are protected, then it will make it easier for us to develop new vaccines. Viruses evolve to become more transmissible. This is true for pretty much all viruses. And RNA viruses evolve much faster than DNA viruses. 
But the question to me is how much will these viruses evolve in a way that matters? Obviously, they will evolve to become more transmissible, but is there a limit to immune pressure and how much the virus can afford to change its spike protein before it loses the ability to bind to ACE2? Viruses actually rarely evolve to become more virulent. This is uh, true of most viruses. There are situations where viruses can become more virulent and mostly that is when the virus can combine with something that comes out of animals or a virus can go from humans into animals and back again. With SARS-CoV-2, we have seen this happen with mink infections in the in particularly in Denmark. So we do have something to worry about here. We need to make sure that we limit the spread of this virus from humans into animals and back. So what really does the future hold for us? I think one of the things that we can be incredibly proud of is the fact that we made vaccines in 10 months. I think actually, given all that we have learned, we can do it in less. We need to get people vaccinated. Vaccines are working well. We really need to protect as many people as possible. We need to do that even as we continue with non-pharmaceutical interventions. There isn't enough vaccine in the world to vaccinate everybody today. And there isn't going to be enough supply to vaccinate everybody in the world this year. So we need to continue with the masking and the social distancing and all the other strategies that we know. It's very important to remember that if the virus does not replicate, it cannot mutate. We need more investment in basic virology. The reason we were able to move fast with the development of vaccines was because of the investments we had made in studying virus structures before this. We understood what viral proteins looked like how they changed, what they did. We need to keep doing this. We need better and less siloed surveillance. Right now, we collect humongous amounts of information, but we use very little of it. And if we need to tailor public health strategies, I think we would do a much better job if we had more joined up data. And for me, Clinical research is something that we do, sadly, very badly in this country. To build up academic clinical researchers, facilities for clinical research will allow us to do better in the future, to test interventions, to test diagnostics, drugs, vaccines, much better than we have done before. Our vaccine companies are absolutely phenomenal manufacturers. And I think just to end, it's our responsibility as researchers to make the R&D ecosystem that feeds our vaccine companies and that is ready for the next pandemic. So thank you very much for your attention. I'm sorry, I'm not going to put those slides. Thank you. Delivering the Professor V. Ramaling Swami Memorial Lecture on an interesting and current topic covering many issues related to public health and your own research findings. And also, thanks for the insightful outlook you gave in the end. Usually, after such an endowment lecture, uh, you know, all the discussions, question answers are restricted to tea time informal way of uh, discussing with the visitor. Since the event has been online, perhaps we may take a few questions if you are okay with that, Mr. Kang? Sure. Okay. So let me go with the audience in the hall, if any. Uh, 
Uh, Professor Uday, yeah, you may turn on the microphone. There's a little, yes, switch there. Yes. Hello, Dr. Kang. Can you elucidate on herd immunity? What is happening there? Zero prevalence and uh, a little bit on that? Thanks, Uday. That's an excellent question. I think one thing that's very important to understand as a concept is that herd immunity comes from closed systems, closed communities that don't interact with other communities. It literally comes from herds or poultry flocks where if a disease is introduced and a certain proportion of um, the animals or birds get infected, then after a while, there are enough infected and protected individuals that the disease stops spreading. So when we apply it to humans, in, to some extent, it works in a similar way to humans, but what we lose track of is the fact that individual level protection is individual level protection. So a person who is protected by being in a herd which has achieved herd immunity will lose that immunity as soon as they step outside their herd. The other thing to remember is that we have very little understanding of super spreading phenomena and whether super spreading can still take place in the context of herd immunity. So I think this pandemic is going to be teaching us a lot about both individual and population level immunity acquired through infection and through vaccination. Yes, sir. Hello, Professor Kang. Yes, it was hi. an excellent talk. This is Ravi. I had met you in THSTI on the autophagy talk. Um, my question was regarding small molecules. We know that um, initial attempts were to use chloroquine and a couple of other ones that, that were uh, similarity with the Ebola virus and things like that. And um, given the fact that the humoral response may not be the strongest in this particular case and there are questions, do you think in the long run though, uh, effective small molecule antivirals will be better off in uh, holding on to especially the super spreading phenomena that you alluded to so i think vaccines and drugs need to complement disease control so the vaccines prevent infection and what we know about vaccines is that they work really well but no vaccine is perfect even 95 percent efficacy is not 100 percent and if this is a virus that's going to infect a lot of the world, then 5% of the population is really a lot. So we will need drugs. The question is, do we need drugs for early in disease or drugs that are active in severe disease? For people who are at high risk, we would want to treat them even early in illness when we don't know whether they are going to progress to severe disease or not. So looking at small molecules, repurp well, available drugs like we did with hydroxychloroquine, this is something that is continuing to happen in multiple clinical trials around the world. The bigger ones are the ones that are evaluating drugs that I think are still of interest. A couple of those are colchicine and uh, nefamostat, which is developed by uh, a Japanese um, manufacturers, which is an antiviral. Colchicine, of course, is an available and very cheap drug that might be useful as well. Um, so continuing to screen for potent, the, I think in the early days, the problem was what tools do you use for screening small molecules? Many of the assays that are available were not very good. The cell lines that were being used for growing the virus were not necessarily the right kinds of cell lines for screening small molecules. Some of those methods have been ironed out now as part of the therapeutics accelerator, and, but these are efforts that are going to need to continue. 
I think Thank you. Uh, and I think we are done with uh, questions from the hall. Let me take questions from online. I see two hands coming up. One, Professor Nagaraja and Professor Su. Professor Nagaraja, you may go first. Gagandeep, can you hear me? Yes, I can, Professor. Yeah. Great. great talk. See, when the uh, original emergent virus in way back in November, December, when it came out, it was sequenced. There was a gene over 14 or something, NSP14. It's supposed to be high fidelity factor compared to other coronaviruses. And with that, one would imagine it will not make so many errors and make new mutations. Uh, that's why this coronavirus was considered as a different one than the others. But yet we keep seeing new variants emerging left and right in different parts. So do you have any uh, yeah. your so, expert uh, view on it? Um, I'm not a viral evolution expert, but I will take a stab at it. So yes, you know, among coronaviruses, you do see some level of proofreading. So they tend to mutate less than other RNA viruses. That's right. Even with the mutations that we are seeing, it's very important to remember that the rate of accumulation of these mutations is actually quite slow, given the number of times this virus has replicated. Every person infected is an opportunity for the virus to replicate. So yeah. what we would see in a much longer period of time for other viruses, we are seeing in a short time frame for this virus, just because of the sheer number of people that have been infected with this virus. But the proofreading exists and the slower rate of mutation is a fact. It's still okay. being monitored and it's there. Okay, thank you. Uh, if I may ask, Remstevir, there are very beautiful papers about the Remstevir and uh, how it uh, inf uh, affects our RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. Yet, at the same time, it doesn't seem to be the most effective against this uh, virus. Uh, That's why right. I, I keep arguing that until you test in humans, you have no idea what's going to work. So the, everything can work beautifully in model systems, yes. but the humans are challenging and very, very heterogeneous. Yeah, thank you. Hello. So, yes, please. Yeah, uh, Mr. Kang, this is Ajay Sood, uh, non-biologist. I heard your talk with a lot of interest, very clear talk. But I have rather a stupid question, and I'm sure it is known. Is it known why viruses mutate? What is their urgency? Or what motivates them? Because they don't think that they have to survive, unlike higher uh, uh, animals. So what makes them mutate that they should survive? Is some something known? And can one attack that part? So in terms of viruses, I think if you look at viruses, there's a range of sizes and there's a range of nucleic acids. David Baltimore classified viruses according to whether they were DNA viruses or RNA viruses, single-stranded, double-stranded, positive sense, negative sense. So in among those, we know that DNA viruses mutate less, RNA mutate more. Why do viruses mutate? Well, there are a number of reasons why mutations happen. Many of them are just errors. So most of the mutations that we see are not going to result in change. So if there is an error in copying and it results in a change in the amino acid. What can happen? Nothing can happen. Something good can happen for the virus or something bad can happen for the virus. If it's a synonymous mutation, you don't care. If it's a non-synonymous mutation, it can be good for the virus. It can be good for the host. 
Good for the host means the virus dies out because that mutation leads to the virus's inability to replicate. Good for the virus is something that allows the virus to replicate better. So it's not like viruses are thinking about it. I think it's just a question of how many changes can possibly happen. And there are, there are a lot of restrictions on viruses. Some mutations tend to happen together. There are some sites that are more prone for mutation, others that are conserved. So uh, mostly essential functions obviously would be conserved as much as possible. Thank you. So it's quite a random phenomenon. Yeah. Okay. See, uh, we don't have any mechanism to take uh, uh, questions from YouTube listeners. Uh, and also time you know is nearing now four o'clock i'll take the last question from professor vidya uh, i am vidya i i was wondering uh, to what extent the tests that are carried out for the zero survey are specific to uh, sars cov2 and are we underestimating the zero prevalence or overestimating the zero excellent question some of the tests out there are really rubbish some of them are pretty good. Usually the tests that are aimed at the spike protein or the receptor binding domain will be good because the SARS-CoV-2 corona spike differs from the other coronavirus spikes. You can see cross-reactivity with the nucleocapsid for other coronavirus infected individuals. But even with any zero survey, the, your measurement is as good as the assay that you have. So there are assays that underestimate. So we did an evaluation of the ICMR Quatch assay now made by Zydus Cadilla with a, a spike assay and the spike was much better than the mm -hmm. Quatch assay. So uh, I think with all of the zero surveys, you have to take the results with a pinch of salt. What I find for a little bit peculiar is that the some surveys are showing 20 percent and then right. when you look at city surveys they are showing you 50 percent mm -hmm. and it to some extent you understand that because in crowded locations you expect a lot of people to be infected mm -hmm. and in rural areas you'll infect you'll expect much fewer people to be infected but it is a pattern, you know, you yeah. saw a survey going from 0.7% to 7% to 20% just shows you that mm -hmm. infections are climbing all the time. And this is something that we should continue to measure, preferably with the same assay each time. Right. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I was told that there are many questions on YouTube as well, but unfortunately, we will not be able to take up and maybe you could interact with uh, Professor Kang uh, when she perhaps may visit our campus in the near future, things working out well. Um, Professor Kang, normally we have a small ceremony following the memorial lecture, uh, but unfortunately we are not able to do this time. So I shall restrict myself to thanking you online. Thank you very much for your eloquent presentation. Please join me in thanking Professor Khan. I also would like to thank Professor Rao and all of you for your active participation. Let's conclude now. Join 40, whoever is here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.